All right, welcome to the Reach Keep podcast. This is Mike Holmes, your host, and today we're covering a very important topic about how pastors can excel at building relationships. And this would be the relationships with the the people in their church so that they can minister at kind of a one-on-one level as opposed to just the preaching. Uh, This uh, message was kind of born, uh, uh, actually presented uh, to a a group of men here not too long ago. I was asked to speak uh, at a group called the Northwest Baptist Missions and the Foundations Baptist Fellowship. They had a joint meeting, and it was kind of the Idaho, Utah, Wyoming chapters, I guess is what you call them. And uh, so we met, and, uh, you know, quite a few folks, I think 40 uh, 40 or so people, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, uh, that I did this presentation to in a church type evening setting actually i think it was in the morning when i did my my session but um the, it came from the idea that so many times we really focus on you know what we'd call bulk evangelism and and uh, there's there's places definitely for that where where we reach everybody kind of broader the preaching would be included in this um you know the ideas of radio ministries and printed ministries and some of that and sometimes we neglect just what we can actually be to a person one-on-one, face-to-face, um, not necessarily on a Sunday in the preaching manner, but just sharing our heart uh, with each other. And I believe that we can excel at that, and I believe we need to uh, excel at that. And I will make my point here uh, as I kind of go through some of these notes that I went through with these men. So uh, if this is your first time here, uh, this is the Reach Keep podcast, kind of our long-form podcast. We uh, take some time and kind of dive into some topics a little bit longer and deeper in this. Appreciate it if you like what you hear to give us the thumbs up or uh, definitely subscribe so that you can get this kind of thing regularly. I know that I often get things that show up you know, on, you know, if I watch a sports thing, then I get something on sports. And if I watch something on fly fishing, I get something on fly fishing. Well, we need to get good things on ministry and how to be better ministers. And so some of that's related to um, if you subscribe, uh, that will help kind of that happen. So I appreciate it very much. Um, I have been a senior pastor uh, for quite a few years, recently turned my church over uh, to a younger man. But all these things I've done and talked about are things that, that, that I've done and talked about. I mean, these are things that, that are real for me and have worked for me. And I would say that we have a fairly healthy relationship type uh, I do with many of the people and have been able to minister in quite a, quite a few different ways. The title of this, um, they'd ask for a title to, you know, when they print things up, and uh, I had used kind of that phrase, and you probably heard this phrase, you know, things that are taught and then things that are caught. And uh, there's often things that, you know, are talked and, you know, taught, and we learn those things. But then sometimes you just really connect and catch a few things. And that is sort of my theme here is that uh, when you get to be one-on-one, that you get to, that's the catching part where you're really making sure that this person and you are bonding and connecting and you're ministering to them uh, in a proper way. And this is not like, you know, being ho-ho good buddies with all your church members and slapping them on the back and being, you know, funsy jokesy with them, that kind of stuff, uh, you know, where you would sort of soften your position as a pastor and being able to speak into your life. This is still, this is where you're bonded with them and you definitely can speak into their life uh, in a much stronger way uh, in a different way than sometimes it happens through pulpit ministries. And there are quite a few things that can be done relationally one-on-one that cannot be done in a, uh, in, in a pulpit-type ministry, and I'll go through that in just a, a little bit. Um, so the, the, the kind of the text here or the idea is that we would catch things and people would catch things from us. And this is not really... Uh, dealing with what I would call one-on-one counseling either. 
Um, many of this, much of this would probably fall into that category for you, but this would not be like, okay, you come to my office at two o'clock and we'll talk till two forty-five, and then you're dismissed and I get another person to come in, you know, not sort of that, that type of thing, but this is where you bond with somebody else and on purpose, and then you speak into their life and they speak into your life and, you know, you learn and grow one from one from another. Um, the main kind of Bible text that I uh, like to launch off of when I kind of talk about these things is the uh, the text that, that really uh, comes with David and Jonathan kind of being having their hearts knit together. And that's in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 18, verse 1. In fact, I can uh, just read it for you. It's just a, a good verse. It says, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And we're using the example of Jonathan here, how he spoke into David's life. He encouraged him, helped him uh, in so many different ways at different times in his life and how important it was uh, to have that and how important it was for him to be that. And as pastors, we can be that to a lot of people. Um, It's not necessarily David's here and Jonathan's here, you know, an authority type of thing. It's just the idea of what happened in their relationship is a really um, can be some beautiful things that we can use as a pattern in ours. They definitely there was a commitment there. He loved him as his own soul. It's their soul was kind of knit together. There are several places where it talks about they made a covenant one with another, and there was this promise uh, type of thing there. Um, and this is something that we have with our church members and people. We are committed to them. They are committed to us. There's also the concept of sacrifice. Uh, the, in any relationship where you are going to step into someone else's life in a great way, you're going to have a level of sacrifice. It's going to take some more time than normal. It's going to take time when you don't want it to take time. Um, Jonathan uh, gave David his sword and his stuff, and you know, there's several examples of, of sacrifice there. And there's another word, um, that uh, is kind of involved in there too. In, in chapter 19, verse, I believe it is two, it says that D- Jonathan delighted in this relationship. And this is the idea that this is not a work, not something that you dread. Oh, I got to talk to that guy again and give him some advice, you know, and believe me, there's probably people like that in your life. If you're a pastor, you know, you give them advice and then they never take it. You know, you probably have some of those. Um, but, you know, it's just not, quite a a bonding type relationship but this is something where you delight in being in with this person and helping them and for you to pour your life into them and that's more the idea you're pouring your life into them Um, it is a really healthy thing and it really fills a need in their soul that can't be filled by just the preaching activities um, that are found in a local church. And there are many great things, and I don't want this uh, sound in any way like I'm against preaching and teaching. We do all that stuff, but there is sort of this extra thing, this relationship time that uh, I I will teach you kind of how we develop uh, some of that relationship time. And some of this is not necessarily you and one other person. This is where you're developing, you're you're creating an environment where other two other little Jonathan and Davids are over here and a couple more over here and a couple more over here, and they're starting to kind of bond and help each other. Um, There would be many times on a Sunday where I preached, and I thought, man, I gave them the Word of God. And if you were to go talk to the people, they'd go, what was so good about Sunday? And they go, well, it was when I talked to, you know, Mrs. So-and-so after church, or I talked to Brother So-and-so, and he we, he listened, and, you know, we, we really got fed. And um, again, I'm, I'm all about preaching and teaching the Word of God, but there sometimes is a place for the individual uh, uh, kind of washing of the water of the Word or sort of the quenching of the Spirit. In fact, I gave an illustration there, and I wish I kind of had a way to do this here with a whiteboard. 
Um, I, I had a whiteboard there when I was teaching, and uh, he, here's sort of my illustration. Um, I want to talk about water, okay, because it kind of washes and quenches and, and some of those things. So water originally comes from God. There's no doubt about that. It comes up out of a well. It comes up out of a lake or it comes up out of a you know river. It's pumped and purified or whatever in a, in a city-type situation. And then it is kind of pumped up to a tank. And once it gets up to like a tank from there, it is the water pressure that feeds, you know, the particular town. And I, I researched a little bit of the of this and, and talked about their town and their water towers just up on the hill. And uh, we talked a little bit about it specifically. But it's the idea that water comes from God, but it does you know, need to be moved around and put into different places. And once it up in that tank and kind of goes out, it is your responsibility. And whether you're watching this as a senior pastor, senior leader, or, you know, layman, you have the, the water of the word of God in your life. And it needs to go down through those pipes, then out to other people. Now, some of this would be you know, soul winning, some of this would be witnessing, some of this would be preaching, and in fact, a huge amount of, of what we would call the, the Word of God is delivered in a preaching type of format, where we're delivering it to the people, and they're, they're being washed and purified. In fact, in a city environment, the the bulk of the water, and, and this little town that I was at, I believe is a town of about 4,000 people, they go through about a million and a half gallons a day of water that goes through those pipes, you know, pumped up into the tank and then through the, from the tank, you know, the reservoir, down the pipes into different places. And the bulk of, of water in almost every municipality um, goes for you know what we would call washing or rinsing or cleansing uh, the solvent side of water you know where it's doing all that type of thing and that's where most of it goes but water does go to another place and that is it goes into a glass and it quenches a thirst and there's not as much of that there's a plenty of washing okay that's going on but there also needs to be a quenching and we need to understand that the our preaching sort of is the you know the washing of the water and we're getting it out to everybody and we're helping everybody at that level but beyond preaching just our speech and our talking can be empowered by God as well and the verse that I have for this that I used is out of Second or First Corinthians chapter two, and Paul said this. Uh, he said, "My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power." And he basically said. You know, my preaching was in the demonstration of of the power of God. Yes, we all know preaching. We want it to be there. But also my speech. So it's his preaching and his speeching. In other words, the times he preached and, 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 you know, really proclaimed the word of God, but also the times when he just simply talked to people was also empowered by God. And if you are a not a senior minister and not necessarily doing the full-time preaching and some of that, then this is definitely for you. You're speaking to somebody in a parking lot, to a child, to a mom or dad after a program is over. That can be empowered by God and can have God's you know, full force on it just as much as the preaching of the Word of God. We tell our workers here that they have just as much of the Spirit of God as the pastor has the Spirit of God, and that God can use them. And every person here, we have that, you know, every member a minister, you probably heard that the phrase, but every member really is empowered by God to reach people and to say words and to connect with people and to be a blessing to them and to help them out. And so, that is the powerful illustration here. So the water, you know, comes from God. It's God's word. It gets in the tank up there, and then from the tank it goes down, and the bulk of it is going to be, you know, through the through the, the, the preaching and through, you know, washing and solvent type of things. But there is an amount of water that goes into every system that just a little bit, okay, just a little bit 
that goes into your system. Maybe you have a well at your house or city system, whatever, and it goes through a pressure tank, comes out, and you wash dishes, and you clean the dog, and you do all sorts of things with your water. But occasionally, you grab a glass of water, and it quenches you and does something for you that just washing water on the outside of you doesn't do. And you and I need to be that quencher. We need to have quenching. We need to be it. And like I say, we need to have environments then where other people, there's a lot of quenching going on. And I'm not talking about just talking about the football game or the weather or, you know, the price of corn or whatever is going on. But there are spiritual needs that are being put out. And there are spiritual satisfaction solutions being brought in. And people are catching things that are Holy Spirit, you know, inspired, powered by God things. That is happening. And that needs to happen. Now, let me give you just a couple little observations I have. Then I'll give you sort of how we do some of that. Uh, and, and some of the ways that are sort of like, well, of course you got to do that. Sort of the duh type of thing. So... Um, the practical things here that I, I had in my notes is that, you know, healthy relationships are absolutely essential for flourishing believers. You need to have healthy relationships. And not only do you need to have them, but you need to give them. In other words, if, you need to be kind of going both ways on this. You need to have someone that listens to you and you talk, and then you have someone that you listen to and you talk and, and you have that. And this is not just too only one person besides you in the church. I mean, you can have this with many people. And again, many of these can go on. So healthy relationships are essential for flourishing believers and flourishing churches. And that's at ReachKeep. What we do here is we try to help people have flourishing churches. And so that's a very important one. And uh, I got another note here that I put down. Um, Just because there has been a thorough washing doesn't mean that the thirst has been quenched. Okay, this is the idea that there can be water all over the place. There can be great teaching and preaching the Word of God, great Sunday school classes, great revival meetings, missions conferences, burden, passion, whatever. And someone can still be carrying a burden that they need to talk to someone about one-on-one. They have a passion. They have something that's confusing them. They have their befuddled in some way. they like, I don't know what's going on, and they need to talk one-on-one. Preaching doesn't solve it. Just because there's a lot of washing going on doesn't mean that people have their thirst quenched. And the last one, I wrote here, uh, before I get to these tips here, kind of show you sort of how we do some of this, Uh, relationship building is worthy of much forethought, design, and management. And this sort of takes us into these things here. It is worthy, the the relationship building, and, and if you are going to build a flourishing church, Okay, there are several elements that we've identified here at ReachKeep. I won't go into uh, the big three, okay, uh, that we have, but I will tell you uh, that one of those three (laughs) is relationships. There needs to be healthy relationships in a church. There's a couple other elements, too, and um, you probably read some of our stuff and know what some of those are. So, It's worthy, though, of the forethought, design, and actually managing. So can you manage a relationship? Can you make some of that happen? The answer, I mean, the quick answer is, like, really, no, you can't make two people, like, get along or whatever. But there are things that you can do that can help make it happen. Let me tell you a story. Years ago, uh, I I was doing kind of online work for a uh, kind of a Christian newsletter that was going out. And they would have questions come in. And so one of the questions came in, and they filled them out to people like us. And we would kind of give our two cents worth, and they'd publish it, you know. Um, So one of the questions came in. The guy said, I have a, you know, youth group of 12 kids, and they're from, uh, you know, they're middle school and high school. And they're from three middle schools and four high schools. And they're all, you know, they're just, they don't have anything in common other than they show up at my church. And I, I'm trying to make a youth group. I'm trying to have cohesive do things together, but they don't even know each other. They live in different parts of town, but their parents bring them. And how do we get them uh, to kind of 
to do that. Well, you can't just say, all right, you kids get along. Everybody memorize someone's name. You know, uh, it's, it's hard to do that. But you can put them together. And I, my suggestion was to uh, uh, get the church van, load them all in the church van, and drive and from where this church was, it was about 2,000 miles. Drive about 2,000 miles to go to Disneyland together. Uh, this is back when Disneyland was worth going to. Uh, go to Disneyland together and then come all the way home. And when you come home, guess what? You're going to have a youth group. You're going to have a family. They're going to have gone through all sorts of things together. You know, cramped in a vehicle together, all the different things they will have gone through all of that stuff and it would have bonded them and and that's a management thing that's something you can do and that's what i want to talk about some things that you can manage that will help some of these relationships get better so let me jump into some of the kind of application here and um i've got kind of sort of a a, a no-brainer type thing and then i have kind of some details for it so um the first one here is just the idea of listen better <laughs> it's obviously if you are going to be bonded with somebody you have to take time to listen better and I think all of us would probably admit I don't listen very well I need to listen better Um, pastors are very famous for talking but they're not famous for listening okay we have a lot of great heroes of the faith and the preachers that are out there and it's because of what they came out of their mouth not have anything to do with their ears and so we need to learn to listen better and so there's some things that you can do and one of them is what what we do here is we adapt our schedules we've changed our schedules some that helps People be in a listening position. We adapt our schedule. That's sort of the key word I want you to get. So we have we have found that after church, people will hang around and, and talk, and people actually come early and talk a little bit. And then we have a place kind of in the middle uh, where we do some. Let me tell you how that works. So um, we have many of our key workers uh, at our church. We have a VIP meeting that is about 45 minutes before our first service starts, and everybody comes to the VIP meeting, and some people come even 15, 20 minutes before that, and they get to yakking and talking. We found that our workers need to have some fellowship, because during the actual church service kind of span, and we run two services and multiple Sunday schools between them and all that, our workers are very busy, and they don't get a lot of fellowship in. So this early time is a place when there can be a lot of, of discussion, and, and we have a formal announcements and prayer time and some uh, stuff we call VIP it stands for vision information and prayer those three things that we share but we break in time to allow them to have some good fellowship and some of that so we kind of make sure that happens and then at the end of the service we have found that people hang around longer afterwards and talk about things and that there's great um, development time that can happen uh, after the service. In fact, we we kind of track it now and keep, write it down. It's uh, it's hang time, and it, like sometimes it's up to an hour after church that people are still around talking. Now, this is very important. If you're reaching a lot of new people, they're not used to coming to all the different services that a church has, so they come to one, and they make it to that one, they will then hang around longer at that one. If you have create that environment, and that's the second little word I want you to get, is the idea of creating an environment where that helps them hang around. So at our church, nobody goes out to lunch after the Sunday morning service. We just don't do that. We stick around so that we can build relationships and talk to people. And again, we sometimes spend up to an hour after church talking to people and we kind of assign, hey, you get that side and I'll get this side or you get the new people. Oh, did you see that new family come in? I'll get them. Let's talk. You know, and we try to meet them and talk with them, interact with them. And we have trained our people to do that as well. One of the little secrets here that we have on this adapting the schedule that we have learned, and uh, this kind of goes against a lot of things that have been sort of taught in the in the church planting world and, and a lot of people don't don't tend to like this uh, topic this suggestion but i'll give it to you anyway um many churches have a handshaking time so part way through the service you know the announcements have been made the pastors say all right let's all stand shake hands one with another or they'll sing a verse or two of a song and then like hey while they piano play just greet all the people around you in fact i was at a church not too long ago and the guy says i just shake hands with a few people right next to you don't go very far in other words he like 
told people not to build relationships is what he basically did because they had more important things to do. And I understand that. And this is the schedule adapting. So what we have done is we have cut out some of the music. A lot of churches sing three or four songs. We usually sing two. And that buys us, you know, six to eight minutes that we use much better. And that is where we'll sing a song or two. Then we'll say, all right, I want you to shake hands, greet one another, grab a cup of coffee. We have some refreshments. You can step out into our atrium. Um, make sure that, you, you know, folks on this side, you say hi to them. Make sure you say hi to them. I mean, we kind of foster this as best we can. And we have a seven, eight, nine minute break in the middle uh, after some announcements and maybe the sermon's sort of been set up and people know what it's going to be about and then you have this break and they start to talk and build relationships. Now, is that uncomfortable for some people? Yeah, a lot of things have been uncomfortable for people, but now they love it, okay? Now they want it. And our visitors, you know, they're offered to get a refreshment. Someone to say, hey, can I get you something? Can I show you this? And they start to build relationships and they start in this six or seven minutes to start conversations that get going, when you're just shaking hands with somebody, you know, for, you know, one verse of a song, all you're doing is shaking hands and kind of being nice, okay? This relationship stuff is more about being nice. It's about starting to figure out what the needs are and meet the needs of those people. So we are trying to foster that. So this six or seven minutes just gets things going. Then when church, you know, then we have our preaching time, you know, we come back in singing him, you know, we have a have preaching time, invitation, all the kind of stuff. When church is over, guess what happens? Boom. They go right back to it and they continue with the relationship and they hang around and talk and talk and talk. And as a pastor, make sure you don't go stand by the door and kind of usher them out the door. Uh, that's a bad place to stand. If you stand in the middle and let people come talk to you, you know, that type of thing. But but spend time talking to your people and create an environment um, where they can do that. So this is sort of that, that hang time. The other thing that we have learned, um, which is part of the creating of the environment, is to make sure that you have some ample uh, refreshments and water and coffee and some of those kind of things, uh, whether they're in your auditorium or not. A lot of people don't do it that way, but um, have something. So when church is over, little kids are going, Mommy, I'm hungry. You know, they, there can be a donut, or we actually have really nice snacks for the children. So we have the yogurt tubes, we have cheese sticks, we have the uh, applesauce squeezy kind of thing. So if a kid is hungry... Mom can get him one of those and she can hang around and talk longer and it stretches that after service time. So you have a before service time, you have an after service time, you have a thing in the middle and all of that is the management and it's stuff that you can plan for and make it nicer. Of course, we have nice music playing during that entire time. Don't have your best relationship person stuck up there on the piano for eight minutes playing. Just play find a push button solution. There's plenty of them. Find your style of music, push a button and off it goes. It starts to play and your best relationship person, which is often the pastor's wife, which is often the person uh, on the piano uh, can be out there building the relationship, then bring them all back together and uh, get to the washing part. But you're doing some of the quenching part right there and you're setting up the quenching part to happen afterwards. So listen better and you can make that by adapting your schedules and creating um, better environments. And there's there's several stories of people in the Bible that, you know, took time to be together with each other. Barnabas and Saul traveled together uh, some. Uh, I, I always like this one, Peter and John. They were going to the temple after the kind of day of Pentecost thing. They were going to the temple, and they're getting ready to, uh, you know, this guy's going to get healed, uh, but they didn't know that was coming, obviously. Um, and so they're, they're walking to the temple, and think of the fellowship that they needed. They got like, hey, let's go, let's go get a cup of coffee and go to a church together, uh, walk to the temple together. And so they did that. And think of the conversation that would have been happening right there along that walk, okay? So you can adapt schedules. You can do things. You can create uh, ways and places where relationships will happen. 
Um, the second one here is that we need to have, we need to do meaningful conversations. We need to value these uh, meaningful conversations. And you as a pastor need to get into conversations and allow conversations to happen. I think uh, the idea of, of meeting with your people and talking to them, we do a lot of interviews here for different things. So we will spend time you know, with a baptism interview or a church membership interview where we sit down and talk to them one-on-one and the, those discussions go all over the place and answer a lot of questions, but they're really the beginning of some powerful, powerful stuff. Now, pastor, if you're a senior pastor, you're paid to talk. You're not paid to listen. And that's sort of the way it is. And so this is kind of hard because many times, when, also when we talk, by the way, we're kind of doing the black and white and here it is and thus saith the Lord. And there's not room for give and take in your sermon. In other words, you don't, your sermon doesn't go along and then people are asking questions and you're you know, having a lot of discussion during the sermon. It's usually kind of a proclamation and then you're done. This is hard. So, Pastor, you need to learn to give and take. You need to learn in a conversation to kind of like a person might go off on a tangent and you have a, you have a great illustration on that or you just preach a message on that or you, uh, you got a verse on that. Sometimes you just got to zip it and listen, listen better so that it actually becomes a conversation and you are not always commenting. Okay, let me say that again, Pastor. Don't always make a comment on everything. You need to take time and you need to be the person, uh, and it's that be, uh, the verse I've got it written down. It's in James, uh, well, word fitly spoken. Okay. We know about that one, uh, in Proverbs, but also, uh, be quick to hear, slow to speak. I think that was written by a pastor, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, the idea that we would be slow to talk, we would take time to listen. In fact, there are many different things that you can uh, do that are not that that are not pre- preaching related things, but you can do them only through relationships. In fact, I have a, a list of them, nine different things that, uh, and I gave it to the pastors here. And if you'd like it, I'll make it available to you as well. I'll put the address on the screen uh, here so you can get this. But the, I found nine different things, and I'm sure there's 50, okay, but I just had nine, um, that you can do or it can happen only, okay, only through to one-on-one and not through preaching. Uh, for example, David and Jonathan, go back to that. There was, David was, had a problem in his work relationship with his boss. His boss was Saul and hired him and kind of put him on the payroll. And in a short order, the boss was trying to kill him, okay? I don't know if you ever had a boss try to kill you with a javelin, but that puts a little confusion in the mind. And so he's, he needed an answer. That's not an answer that comes from preaching. That's an answer that comes from talking to somebody. There was massive confusion in his life. And he went to Jonathan like, what is going on? What have I done? And Jonathan then tried to you know, make some amends there and took his dad out and did that. That all came from a one-on-one relationship. And you and I know, need to have uh, one-on-one relationships because there are things that can be done when someone is in confusion, when someone has uh, problems that are not biblical problems, but they just need to be heard. And this, many of this falls into a career seeking, spouse seeking, uh, medical issues, all sorts of things where someone's like, pastor, I just need some advice. I just, you know, should I go in for this thing or should I go to that other town to get treatment or, you know, they, they just need to talk to somebody and get some advice and spend some time doing that. So this is an important, important thing. And if you would like that, uh, I'll, I'll put the thing on the screen. Just go ahead and uh, click on that, fill, go to that thing, and it, it's an email deal, and it'll go poof, and you'll have it uh, right there. So that is the nine, the nine different things. So pastors need to have meaningful conversations. You need to make sure that those are happening. Um, we have in our nursery one of the values that we set up there when we started our nursery is that people wouldn't just be holding a baby, okay, but they would be there creating a meaningful conversation with a young mom. They would spend time talking to the young moms because many times – 
who you hand your baby to, you put a lot of trust in their life. And uh, so there's sort of this instant bonding there. And people can come and talk to the nursery worker in a way that they can't do. Let that happen. And let your, tell your nursery workers to be having meaningful conversations and to be, you know, celebrating those things. In fact, that takes me kind of to the, the last one here is the idea of prioritizing relationships. In other words, it becomes an important part of your church that you let this happen. And so you celebrate, you know, those things. When, uh, if, you know, there's been a great win of a, a great discussion and someone's after church talking for two hours and getting counsel and just they, all that, it's like, those are really cool things. You know, don't go and say, hey, we got to get this place shut down so we can get back here for more preaching, uh, you know, choir practice or whatever. No, if there's some talking relationship going on, make it available, your building available so people can talk and continue to minister one to another. If there's great counseling, you know, going on after the um, sermon has been preached, you know, make it, let that happen and, and nurture that and celebrate uh, that type of stuff. So this is the idea of, of proper talk leads to proper relationships. And some of this comes out of the book of Titus. Um, and again, I'm not doing this kind of as a preaching message here, but um, the older women talk to the younger women okay, and shared some things with them in the book of Titus. And there's some other advice to younger boys. And in fact, First John, younger men, sons, hear these things. All of those things are valuable. And all of those are more talky-talky, one-on-one, uh, you know, type of things as opposed to preaching. The, the women, older women wasn't preaching at the younger women. They were talking about things. One of our nursery times, we had a, this great victory. You know, we talked about, you know, having this great talk afterwards. And, and may, if someone comes in and talks. And our nursery, I walked in after church, or actually it was between two services, and I looked in the nursery, and here's a brand new young mom, and she's talking to our nursery workers. And boy, they were like, "Oh, this is good." This, is I could, so I kind of, sort of stood by the door, like, "Just a minute, there's something going on in there," you know. I try to sort of slow things down to let that go. And afterwards, when they came out, I I said, "How'd it go?" That was like so good to see you guys, and they're talking. And of course, I thought they were obviously talking about the sermon, you know, and my great exposition of the Word of God. It turned out they were talking about teething uh, on a baby, but to the mom. That's what was important, and that started to build that relationship. And that's what we need to do: is have a, a, a celebrate those wins and 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 value those kind of discussions that happen. And don't just put all the value on the pulpit. Oh, the, it's everything's on the pulpit. The pulpit ministry is everything. No, there's actually a lot of stuff that goes on besides the pulpit ministry in a good, healthy church. And you can manage some of those things. So this is the, uh, the idea here um, that we just need to make sure that we are quenching people and that we are saying, dear God, help me to be a quencher. Help me to be somebody that quenches a soul. Help me to set up quenching environments. Help there to be, you know, little groups of quenching going on here and here and here throughout the week after our Bible study. We have some Bible studies that after the Bible study is over, people stand around and talk for an hour and a half. It's like, yes, that's exactly uh, what we want. We want good quenching going on. So um, the bottom line, here is that people are going to catch things. They're going to grab hold of certain little tidbits. I hope they remember all my sermons. Obviously, that's the most important thing is my sermons, okay? I'm joking here. The important thing is that they catch something from the Word of God. And if you have Spirit-filled people in different positions in your church and they are speaking out and their soul is being knit and they were bonding one to another and they were sacrificing and they're delighting in those things, then you know what? God's going to do some great, great things through this relationship building. If you need to learn more about relationship building, you can go to the Better Sundays podcast on Apple or Spotify, wherever it is, and Way back in, in the very beginning uh, when we started this, some of that podcast, that was probably three four years ago now, there are some great sessions there on building relationships. And I probably need to have the links for those and, and get, get those to you here somehow. But if you can go back and find those, those would be great. We probably need to talk about this. And if this has been helpful or if you have questions on this or you'd like more of, of learning how to build relationships, leave a comment in the in the box 
boxes below uh, the video here and say, hey, I'd like to learn more about this. I'd like to learn more specifically how you can manage relationship building or environments in your church, uh, schedule things. Um, and I'd be happy to speak more to that. So uh, leave a comment below here uh, wherever you are. Or you can always reach me at info at reachkeep.com. That's I, info, I-N-F-O, at reachkeep.com, and we will do that. This relationship building stuff is powerful, and I want you to remember that it is a thing that God empowers as well as the delivering of the Word of God. And so keep that in mind that this is a powerful thing that you and I can use, and make sure that you are starting to do a couple of these things, listen better, Create those meaningful conversations, holding your tongue a little bit, uh, you know, spending some time, you know, diving into what their needs are and, uh, you know, some of that. So, all right, I better go. But thanks for being with us here at the Reach Keep podcast. And again, if this was helpful, please do me a favor and subscribe. We would appreciate that. And if this is really, really helpful, share this with somebody. There's a share button down there um, uh, on YouTube anywhere beneath the video, usually a share on the side and you can push that button and then you can put in someone else's email address or you can put it on Facebook, post it a lot of different places, Instagram, wherever you hang out. And I would appreciate that so much. So we are slowly building a, uh, a good group of followers here and I'm grateful for every one of you. Thank you for the feedback that I get um, from the variety of different things. So anyway, this is Mike at the Better Sundays. I almost said it the wrong way. That's the that's our shorter podcast, <laughs> the Better Sundays podcast. You can go listen to those. But this is Mike at the Reach Keep podcast. So uh, God bless you and have a good one. And we'll talk to you again soon.